Hi, I'm Duncan Chappell. I'm co-director of the Analyst Observatory at the University of Edinburgh. Vinny, thanks so much for having me here today. Duncan, pleasure. We, I know we've known each other for a long, long time, and I, I know you've been doing this survey for a long time, so glad to It's true. Oh, yeah. Th this is actually the, the 20th year that we've been doing the Analyst Value Survey. So we've been, um, we've been really with the analyst industry through through the ups and downs you know we started doing the survey in the in the wake of the of the dot-com uh, crash we we went through the the credit crunch now through the pandemic it's been really intriguing to see the long-term trends in the analyst industry and also to see what has the pandemic done to the way that, that people are using analyst research um, what I'd like to go through with you today are just some highlights from the most recent survey, which we closed up in, in November uh, 2021. And the results have been put together by Dr. Taya Palo, who's also co-director of the observatory at the University of Edinburgh Business School and, and myself. W one of the things that I think is, is useful to, to do is just point people to the Analyst Observatory's website. Uh, there's lots of things that I could say about the survey that I can't possibly say today. So here's the here's the address. People can serve themselves if they go I'll, to I'll, AO. I'll embed the link in the um, post that I include this in. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, so just to give some some context, after 20 years, the Analyst Value Survey is still actually the only uh, survey, the only longitudinal survey that happens happens right, repeatedly of the users of, of analysts. So we're looking on everybody who's using industry analyst firms like, like, like Gartner and Forrester, not just looking at, at premium users who subscribe, but we're looking at, at free users, people who are, who are not paying those firms. And we're capturing insight from uh, users of around the 60 or so largest analyst firms, which represent the vast majority of, of use. And what we've seen is that Unlike the 1990s, when I was an industry analyst, back then people would only access analyst research really through subscription access. Okay. Now, most people who are using analyst research are, are not paying anything for it. Even if their company might have some people with seats, with access seats, um, most analyst value is being created outside of subscriptions. Interesting, because I, you know, I was a gardener for five years and yeah. in the Y2K run up, and my God, I probably did 10,000 phone calls. And the yeah. only way you could access us was going through the gamut system we had. And it, it, it was pretty controlled in terms of accessing analysts. And it still is. But if you think now, most people who read a Gartner Magic Quadrant aren't paying for it. They're getting a licensed oh. copy offline. And now with the rise of Gartner's Peer Insights, its review survey, yeah. actually more people are using Peer Insights than using Magic Quadrants. Huh. Uh, and, and, and those are free. Uh, so for us, it's quite a, 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 a an intriguing shift, and we've been um, very lucky over the last three years to be funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, the British government, basically, to to look firstly into how analyst research is, is produced and diffused, but also to see what companies, particularly early stage companies, do to to benefit from analyst research, and we've been helped in this by three partners who help us diffuse the results. The most notable of these is Tech UK. It's the tech association for the UK's high technology industry. We're also aided by CC Group, which is a business to business public relations company and Sage Circle who have helped commercialize the research and in, in, in that way of uh, paying for more research to, to explore the study more deeply. You know, I had, uh... Paul Greenberg last week, who's a CRM analyst. Yeah. And he's been doing a lot of work on how content is created, distributed, and consumed as the workforce is becoming much more Generation yeah. Z and millennial. Fascinating trends in how, you know, you create content, I create content, but sometimes we forget that the consumers are changing quite radically too. So this is absolutely true. I, in fact, I, I, yesterday I published a podcast with an organization called Research HQ. And what, one of the things that we were talking about there is how in this pandemic, uh, buying centers have really changed. Um, we're seeing people are kind of curating their own information much more. 
They're involving vendors much later. And depending on the organization, some buying centers are getting much smaller and they're really harder to influence because they come into the purchasing process having done all of this research and not really having engaged the vendor. And this is very hard for vendors that wouldn't automatically get on the long list. Right. You know, uh, obvious vendors benefit uh, those those who aren't so obvious uh, don't. You know, the um, other thing I did, I, I started a part of my content change. I, I somehow last March, I go, oh, I wonder if executives have more time now. So I started approaching C-level executives in different industries. Not only did they have time, they said, record us and happy to share. So I captured them under a lot of stress, 50 different industries. And that kind of opened my eyes on how every industry is changing. So I've been going back to each vendor and saying, talk about your verticals, guys. And like you say, many of them are unprepared. So if you're unprepared, how are customers going to tap on your shoulder, right? So, yeah, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's multiplied by the huge technological changes that are happening over the last couple of couple of years. You, you think of the way that organizations, especially in North America and Western Europe, have rapidly moved onto the cloud. And, and we thought that the cloud would solve all sorts of technology problems, which it does. And then it opens up uh, completely different uh, problems because often we don't have visibility on, on performance problems. We've got a whole series of, of technological issues. This, this phenomenon of, of shadow IT, individual managers just, just buying buying things. And I think vendors are struggling to keep up with this just as much as, as corporate IT uh, leaders are. And that reflects the reality that IT innovation is being driven by people at the bottom of the organization rather than by IT leaders very often. Or, or certainly at the front of the organization, right? So yeah. a healthcare executive told me, he says, you know, when we started playing, this is a big organization. We started mm -hmm. playing with telemedicine in 2001. He says for 20 years, 2% of out, outpatient visits used tel telemedicine. He says within three months, it had gone up to 50%, right? Yeah. So everyone was looking for telemedicine last year. And who yeah, was yeah. looking for it? Not necessarily the person at the bottom, somebody mm. who is running the, the front, clinical, yeah. clinical side of the business saying, my God, people want to deal with us this way. We can't afford to force them to come in. We just cannot make them come into the clinics, right? So, yeah. That is a very powerful example. And it's the kind of transition that a year earlier, people would have said it would have taken 20 years to make that kind of transformation happen. This is a perfect example. He said, we tried for 20 years, suddenly yeah. it happened. Phenomenal, really phenomenal. Well, we had insight from around 900 people in our, in our survey, and all of them have been navigating exactly these challenges over, over, the, last, uh, uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, they're all over the world. They're in most of the world's largest countries in, in all of the industries that you might, might imagine that they're in. So uh, it's uh, relatively, you know, it's, it's a big enough sample to be statistically relevant, but it's still relatively, uh, still relatively modest. It's about 100, uh, 18, 90, 100 people every month. And then and in terms are, of, yeah. Who consumes this survey? Mostly analyst relations folks, or is it a broader audience? You, I would say. Um, I mean, the results are really consumed in in two ways. We we diffuse uh, like highlights of the results. So we, uh, for example, we've been sponsored to do analyst firm awards, where in different industries we pick out firms that are that are performing very well. Uh, they're generally just the very largest firms. So you know, there's very few surprises there. And then also we produce a premium report, which gets sold, but drills very deeply down. And to be honest, that report is pretty much exclusively bought by investors and by management consultancies that are involved in due diligence on the analyst firms themselves. Okay. So for example, it's been, it's been really interesting over the last few years with IDC, there have been a lot of transactions about, you know, IDC being bought by the Chinese and then, and then being sold by the Chinese. Uh, and um, and that's been really intriguing because along with a copy of the report, people get um, uh, an interactive workshop where we can slice and dice the data. So it's been really intriguing to me to be in several conversations with people. I, I don't really know who they are or what companies they work for, but they're asking me really smart questions. Uh, so that's been uh, a really exciting thing over the last few years. 
Um, actually, I think very few analyst relations people have a discretionary budget. It's kind of interesting how analyst relations people maybe aren't, um, they're very comfortable focusing on one or two big, big analyst firms generally, and they might not want to know uh, that, you know, it, it would be really comfortable to think that Gartner and Forrester and IDC were 90% of the problem because then you could ignore everything else and you've got limited number of things to do in the day. Uh, and I think what, what our research has shown over the years is that the analyst landscape gets more and more complex and nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> unless, unless you're setting up a new analyst firm, no one wants to hear that. Uh, you know, it's easy. I mean, I understand why you, you focus on Gardner, the magic quadrants of the peer insights get so much coverage. But again, the content has become so fragmented that yeah. people are finding it in different ways. So if you just depend on that, uh, you're hurting yourself. And what I find is I have several vendors over the last 10, 15 years who have learned to deal with folks like me, right? Mm -hmm smaller firms and there are others who just still live in the world of hey so long as i yeah. so long as i get in the magic quadrant in the right part of the magic quadrant my job is safe so why yeah. why should i stick my neck out right so that's true it's really true and, and i think a, a lot of that depends on just on the reality of the organization you know if you're if, if, if you're a if you're a market incumbent versus a, a market shaper a market changer then you've got very different perspectives but Certainly what we're seeing is that the people who people are using analyst research, like we have big growth in the Far East, for example, people are using analysts who weren't using them before, and they're definitely not paying $100,000 a year uh, for an analyst seat to do that. So they're, they're, there's a generation of people who are growing up using analyst firms, and people are using more analysts, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're more able to distinguish the, between the quality of good and bad analysts, but they're able to use them, yeah? And there, there isn't the same um, kind of hierarchy of authority. I mean, there definitely are more authoritative firms, but they're not necessarily the biggest ones. You know, the, the largest firms that they're, they're seen as being pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, and, and later on, we, we, we've got some insight about independence. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at, at how end users perceive the quality of these research firms, because, because generally they're seen as being fairly independent. But one or two of them are definitely not independent, but one or two of them are seen as being really highly, highly scrupulous. And that's very different. Um, the, the analysts are used, I'd say more extensively in places where the IT investments tend to be bigger. And, and I think that's pretty self-evident because the bigger the purchase, the riskier it is, the, the more you're going to, to use other areas. And the big difference over the last year was that use grew very rapidly in, high, in healthcare and life sciences for completely unsurprising yeah. uh, uh, reasons uh, for the, the, that we've already discussed. If I were to guess in the past, FinTech was probably on top. Uh, banking financial services is yeah. always on top, yeah. But, yeah. but previously manufacturing would have been a little bit, uh, a little bit higher. And I think retail, uh, retail held almost firm. I think retailers have also been scrambling to change their business model. Uh, in much as well in, in different ways from healthcare, but for the same reasons. If I were to make a prediction, I think industrials, not manufacturing, but broader industrials, you will see much more traction in the next few years. Yeah. A lot of product companies are moving into services. It's a trend called servitization. So yeah. a lot of money is going into that. Yeah. And I think the, the way in which manufacturing, I think the, the change in manufacturing is, continual, is continually uh, globalizing. We're seeing the rise of like 5G factories, IoT factories, uh, just-in-time delivery, speeding up, becoming even more precise. And they're, and they're moving closer to the consumer, right? So yeah, dependence on China has shown the world it, the supply chains are just too long. So that's another yeah. another big change happening. Absolutely, I think there's a kind of intimacy that, that you see in the way that enterprises directly engage with customers in things like WeChat and so on. And also simply the fact that in the Far East, most purchasing goes through mobile wallets rather than through you know, credit cards or banks. There's an intimacy in the customer relationship, which I think Western brands are often um, un 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 unable even to, to, uh, to imagine. Um, I mean, we, we don't do, I mean, some of, the, some of the innovations I've seen, especially around fulfillment in the US um, and I'm sure in the UK, 
last yeah. mile delivery, just scale of uh, yes. uh, last mile delivery, micro fulfillment, and so on. There have been some the West huge isn't, changes. Yeah, the West yeah. isn't exactly slouching that way. I think what's interesting about the if you look at, for example, very, very low latency grocery deliveries in the West, you know, I, I, I can get my, I can get a pint of milk delivered in 15 minutes here in, here, here in the city centre. Um, I think often that's a customer acquisition play rather than, rather than a profitable and sustainable business model. Yeah? Um, and I think a whole series of things mean that the, the economics of that might be different in China or Malaysia or uh, you know, for a, whole, for a whole series of reasons. But I'm, I'm talking to a number of corporate uh, CPG consumer co companies yeah. that are looking at direct to consumer channels. Yes. And they're a little bit they're a little bit worried that Amazon and Spotify and those players have too much control over the consumer, right? So true. It's it's always a push and pull where companies want proximity to the consumer and mm -hmm. not have to go through multiple channel masters. So I mean, it, it swings back and forth. It's true. I think, and there's a tension there because I'd say, instinctively, I would say organizations go more, organizations, early stage retailers are more likely to go directly to customers than they were. Uh, but they understand that very often they have to start off by going through channels, even if that means going through Kickstarter or, you know, going through Etsy or, you know, depending on what you're, depending on what you're making. But I think there's a strong understanding of the benefits of, of building up a direct customer a relationship, really an individual to individual relationship um, that that didn't exist, you know, 40 years ago. Imagine you'd invented a board game or something, you know, you, you, there's no way that you would, you, you would have marketed that directly to consumers, you'd have just gone to retailers. And the idea of going or to, to wholesalers, you know, probably, uh, whereas I think now the, the whole dynamic of the whole dynamic of these things is... Uh, is I'm is looking different. at your list on this on this slide. Yes. I don't see hyperscalers there. Is that, did you? No, I mean, we, we didn't have that. I mean, we've got cloud computing, I suppose, but I think generally what, what the, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, we don't have that. We don't have that as an option. We've got a list of about 50 things. And I think that very often, I think the, I think the vendors are interested in the notion of hyperscalers. But I think I think buyers want to get you know they want to get security they want to get storage they want to get cloud computing you know whatever it is um, the um, the use of the only because you had IT services and I think maybe it's included in that but hyperscalers have really become major yeah. ticket items right yeah it's it's interesting to see the way that I think there's also a kind of uh, there's almost a demographic division inside technology purchases that I think some people think that they're, you know, I think maybe some people think they want to buy cloud computing and other people think they want to buy uh, IT services, you know, and this is why, you know, if you look at the, so for example, if you think of the big sourcing advisory firms, yeah, they spend a lot of time speaking to IBM and, and, and Kindrel and Accenture and so on, but I don't think they spend so much time speaking to, to, to Google and Amazon web services and uh, Microsoft uh, and, and even though what they're what they're selling is perhaps exactly the same uh, kind of computing power. Well, um, the, well, customers certainly are buying from those guys, even if they, even if they really are. <laughs> they absolutely are, and they're winning some of the and they're winning some of the biggest deals around. And I think part of that is exactly because um, the vendors uh, don't have the same power that they had because of the way that people are educating themselves. Obviously, AWS has a very, and Microsoft and, and Google, they have very impressive direct enterprise sales. That's how they're winning, you know, huge, huge deals. But I think this also says something about the maturity of the buyer. We, we ask buyers about different services that they get from analysts. I apologize for this. I should really replace these with something less painful like Harvey Balls. Uh, but we ask people which services they, they, they use and, and how far they rate them. I think it's kind of unsurprising that, that research is the thing that's most used. But the interesting thing is that over this last year, analyst value increased. So the number of people who said that the services they, that they got from analysts uh, was, was valuable increased. And the number of people who said that that value was very high increased. Nice. Okay. Uh, so that's a, that's a positive move that, that, that we also saw in, in, in 2020. 
It's interesting, it, though, yeah. you know, to go back to a point we covered earlier. Yeah. AR doesn't seem to have the AR value in organizations seems to be declining a little bit, which is different from what you're saying. You know, it seems like if the analyst is growing in importance to buyers, vendors should be paying a little more attention to it. So maybe there is a lag there. Um, I don't think it's a lag. I think it's a disconnection. Um, one of the things, so uh, alongside my, my role here at the University of Edinburgh, I also work for a public relations company in, in London, CC Group. And, and one of the things that, that, that we do is, is simply because of the way that we're organized, we're organized by vertical markets and we commission uh, external researchers to do extensive buyer surveys. So for example, in, in Internet of Things or in financial technology or in telecommunications or something. You know, so, so we'll get a research company to go out and speak to like 150 buyers in the major markets that influence customers. And what we see is that depending on the stage of the sales cycle, analysts are, analysts are quite influential when it comes to technology directions. But when you come through to shortlisting, they're really extremely influential. Uh, frankly, they're, they're more influential than the media. But almost every tech organization spends more on public relations than, than on analyst relations, even if analysts are more influential. And, and I think that's because of two disconnections. I think firstly, it's about being able to transparently show the value of analysts. I think a lot of analysts are not very open about who they're influencing or how. And then secondly, it's about a lack of observability of, of, the, of how analyst relations changes the minds of analysts. Mm. Obviously, many analysts would say, look, if, if you want to change my mind, leave me alone. And when I ask you a question, give me an answer quickly. <laughs> so, so, which is not unreasonable. Um, you know, what, it's, what, it's, it's probably also the vendor culture, right? I mean, yeah, I came absolutely. from Waterhouse. Uh, you came from that world also. I yeah. still talk to vendors who go, oh, the, the, the big five or the big four, big five are so influenced in the sales cycle. I go, go do a proper survey, right? Mm. You'll find they're required to be independent. They don't really influence the deal. You, you, you sell, it depends on how you perform, you win the deal. Mm. Don't, don't give them that much credit, right? So yeah. I think there are some myths that have, that have settled into the vendor world that are very difficult to displace. Same thing with analysts. They, they have certain yeah. notions that, that are not always valid. I think that's absolutely true. What we've done, a few months ago, I did some really interesting quantitative um, data analysis. You, you may have heard of this software company called AR Insights that produced a tool called Architect, yeah, that's used by almost all the big tech vendors. And I had the opportunity to do a really enjoyable statistical analysis, uh, looking at, at what the impact was of, uh, of analyst relations. And, and you, you won't be surprised at all uh, to hear uh, that the more often a vendor meets an analyst, the more favorable the analyst becomes towards them. I mean, you know, it, you have to see, a, you have to see a, an advert for ice cream 20 times before you buy the ice cream. And of course, it's gonna be the same for a high tech vendor. Um, and so in a, in a very, very simple way of just raising awareness, analyst relations is, is extremely effective. And in fact, I, I published something recently looking uh, also at the, at the impact that peer reviews, like for example, uh, Gartner analysts work for an organization that collects customer reviews. These customer reviews also have a very big, very big impact on, on, on analysts, both directly because they use the reviews but also indirectly because people who complain to, a, to Gartner in, a, in an online review will complain to an analyst in an offline telephone call. Um, uh, so the, the, the impact of, of analyst relations, if anything, it's a little bit shocking to see how impactful analysts is, uh, analyst relations is on, on analysts. But I think analyst relations people typically are not quantitative minded and they are actually a little bit, um, you know, I mean, I do want to stereotype communications people, but, you know, th there's a reason why analyst relations people don't love this data. Yeah. There's a reason why it's investors and management consultants who love this data. And, you know, some, 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 some of them are set in their ways, right? I mean, I, I have been on a crusade yeah. for the last decade to say, don't just send us to user conferences and have us walk in, around your events. Do an analyst summit. 
do it well, right? You'll have much more impact. And Definitely. I had a couple of vendors who say, who the hell are you to tell us that? Go keep going to our events. And okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. I'm telling you what I've seen is very, very effective. But that's exactly. okay. You don't need, you don't need to change. <laughs> I think this also comes back to this build a better mousetrap myth that so many people have uh, that nobody can believe if they look at the world around them because we rarely have the best of everything uh, uh, available to us. I think a lot of techno tech firms are, are run, uh, necessarily they're run by passionate engineers who, who strongly believe in the, in the technology decisions uh, that they've taken, and very often organizations are connected with buyers that, 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 that see value in their solutions. And they assume that what is going to work for that, that passionate first time 100 customers uh, is, is going to carry them through to, uh, to dominate. And, and honestly, I see this also when I speak to industry analysts. You know, industry analysts are very correctly, very proud of their work. They're really smart people. They work really hard. Uh, that they think that their research should penetrate very deeply. But actually, when we ask people which analyst firms they use, you know, people are using a lot of firms. I mean, okay, we're asking people which firms they use in the course of a year, and a year is a very, very long time, right? Uh, so, you know, it, it, using each the idea that each person on average would use eleven firms, uh, that that actually isn't a very la large number if if you if you think of how how long long a year is. And it's also not surprising that all that the vast majority of people are using IDC, are using Gartner, are, are using Forrester. These are the largest organizations. Um, but there are some organizations that have really been able to build, build momentum. And a lot of that is because what they're doing is often something like content marketing or like a classic freemium model. And, um, and I must say the big four who have really relatively modest market research operations really just big enough to feed their own business development goals they're producing obviously to these are massive organizations yeah so you know D Deloitte Research I used to work at Deloitte Deloitte Research that's a credible organization I never thought of it as being a very big one but if you think about it you know it, you know it, it, you know they could have more researchers than the 10th biggest analyst firm so there's a huge plurality of research you're right I mean customers do they're finding their content and many and advice, right, in many, many different ways. And the big four are not somewhat conflicted, but they are influencers in their own in their own right in a number yeah. of ways, right? But Absolutely. then look at outsourcing their advisory firms, Everest and so on, that are actually more influential yeah. than the gardeners, right? So I agree. Yeah, especially late at the very end of the sales deal. At the very very end of the sales deal, uh, this is another very good example of of the way that organisations focus on the visible above the important. Um, there are something like three thousand third party advisors, sourcing advisors, uh, so a much smaller number than there are industry analysts. But vendors generally are putting much more effort into industry analysts because it's much easier to contact them, and they almost always say yes if you're polite and and reasoned and, and relevant. Whereas sourcing advisors, they will need a good reason to spend time with you, and that is harder and requires uh, more intelligence. But it's really intriguing to see how little effort goes into into third party, uh, into trying to influence third party that, advisors. Duncan, I'm glad you are opening people's eyes. I hope they keep listening to you. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit worried about time. I, okay. I, I wonder if I've taken too much of your time. No, no, now. no, please, please, please keep going. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that we ask people, of course, is which firms do do they uh, do they use? Here I've got rather confusingly, this is like one list that goes over from the bottom of one column into the top of the next because you know our, our screens go go that way around. But when you look at the at the big firms, there are some changes here over the last few years. Like one big surprise to me is, that Deloitte and KPMG and PwC and EY, people keep on thinking of those as analyst firms. And, and for a while, we kept on saying to participants in the study, sorry, it's not really an analyst firm. We're, we're not going to count your, we're not going to count you. But these organizations are so uh, emergent. And you were just talking about third party advisory organizations like Everest Group and, uh, and ISG. 
you know, again, hu hugely influential organizations and people, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I may not think that margarine I I is butter, but if people buy it and call it butter when they put it in their fridge, then you exactly. know, then it's then it's then it's butter. Exactly. You know, so I, there's... I I ran for Price Waterhouse their software intelligence function, which yeah. was an internal analyst firm. Mm. Partner found me that I was doing that and hired me. Right. So, and I had to tell them these firms have a lot of intelligence that and yeah. practical knowledge that as an analyst firm, you don't often get, you know? Yeah, it's very true. And I used to work at Ovum, that, that, which did a lot of work uh, in, the, in the telecoms industry. And we would regularly find that large telecommunications operators, especially the international telecommunications operators, of course, they had superior market intelligence uh, to us you know, on many questions. Um, that, 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 you know, we, that's, that's a fascinating point you're bringing out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. We we go through in the study where we ask people about like different scenarios where we where we think people are, are, are where we think analysts are particularly influential. Yeah, and that's where these 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 very nuanced bars with lots and lots of thin stripes suddenly start turning into um, into 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 charts where there are more clear winners. You know. When we ask people not which analyst firms you've used, but which firms do your customers use or your clients use, it changes very much. Yeah, like Gartner explodes from being a relatively, you know, like a like, like a, a very the leading player, uh, but certainly not the only player. Uh, it turns suddenly into being like an extremely visible uh, strip in the in the market, and people might be using eleven firms, but they only think four firms on average are influential on on, on customers. Did you look at the services like G2 that have opened up in the last two years? Yes. Oh, still not? Okay. Yeah, 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 no. But in fact, ah, conveniently, here's G2 in the middle of this chart. It's bright green strip here, perfect, perfect timing. Um, so yeah, we are asking about, about G2 uh, research and IT Central Station, uh, similar players to that. Yeah. And, um, and it's worth saying that that they themselves, of course, are becoming more like traditional analyst firms. You know, when G2 launched, they, they really thought that they would uh, have a, a data-driven model, uh, that they wouldn't need this, these qualitative connoisseurs uh, with their mystical guru uh, manners. But now, of course, they understand you need to employ analysts in order to translate this, this massive data into a story uh, that buyers can, can relate to the challenges that their own organizations are facing. Yeah. And then um, we'll, we also ask about, about investors. And here you see Gartner, IDC, Forrester. Again, the, these bars become, become even fatter as the use cases become more specific. Um, there's one chart that I would really like to, uh, to, 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 to show to you. I've got this chart here, which I'll step through about uh, who gained users and lost users during the path of, of last year, most firms were, were fairly stable. I'm not sure that many of these changes are really very, are very meaningful, but I would just point out that, that Gartner's growth was extremely substantial. Uh, and, you know, Gartner, you know, if Gartner grows 1%, 2%, that means it's, you know, increasing by more than the size of Forrester. Uh, every every year, so that's that's really quite remarkable, and even in in, in the long tail, uh, the, the the kind of firms that come under, underneath the leaders, it's interesting to see that there are some firms that have been able to in, 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 go through some extremely rapid uh, rapid growth, uh, and many of those are firms that are in that are focused on business problems that were extremely sensitive to uh, uh, to the pandemic, uh, like Canalis, which is a specialist in the channel. Enterprise strategy, which is a specialist in storage and storage deployment. You know, suddenly people are all over the world, so storage has to be seen very differently. Then you know, Gardner, telecoms. Gardner, through the alumni context I have, has done very well in the last decade. For a while in the early 2000s, you know, they yeah. went through a little bit of a plateau, but um, they, they've done very well. It's an amazing organization. If I was a Gartner shareholder, I would be <laughs> extremely content, really, really extremely content. 
and um, it's um, you know uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, of uh, when when uh, when elephants learn to dance. You know, uh, there's something there that for a long time you could really say that Gartner. Uh, al almost parodied uh, the, 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 the stolidness and conservatism of, uh, of, of, its big, of its big customers and, and its, and its uh, uh, investment uh, roots, even though it always had a flamboyant jokiness uh, about it at the heart. Talking about conservatives, right? I was one of the first remote analysts Gardner hired in 1995. And Forrester, for the longest time, did not buy into that model. George Colony yeah. yesterday posted a blog. They're moving Absolutely, forward. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So the pandemic has forced even them to rethink. Their, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very big. I think these last years we've, uh, I think we're we're at the start of maybe a generational shift in in the way that people are using technologies and and, and designing designing organizations there's one chart that i really want to show you yeah. which is about uh, which is about independence so this is a really fun chart uh, we ask people to score the the analyst firms on a scale of one uh, one to five uh, for for how independent uh, they they are where five is very independent and one is not is not very independent and here we've picked out that 16 firms where we had extremely large numbers of people who, who had an opinion on, uh, on, on that question. And of course, when you look at this chart, the first thing that you notice is uh, the co companies that are at the top and the companies that are at the bottom. But actually what I would really encourage you to look at is the average. On a scale of one to five, that average is not very high. And I think it's really intriguing that we have like Frost and Sullivan is what, 60 years old, uh, you know, Gartner, Gartner is decades old. All of these organizations are uh, uh, even, I mean, even 451 is more than a decade old. Yeah, All of these organizations are very well established professional services firms. And in what other market are professional services firms of, of this size and of, of this uh, uh, impact? Um, this impact and 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 this self seriousness, you know, that the French talk about amour propre, self love, you know, like the analyst firms, they're really they're really proud of themselves, yeah. Uh, and yet, when you think of this, that the in that the leaders in this industry, I mean, actually, it's, it's not so diff different, even even in the following fifty firms, but the leaders in this industry, they're seen as being, yeah, sort of independent. And and I think that's really I think that's really intriguing. And when we drill down, kind of into the you know, into it, the next, it, yeah, I could, I could see it at Gartner when I was there. When I the, yeah. the 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 early Gartner analysts were, we should proudly talk about how we absolutely took the buyer executive side and and you know I mean they would cite example after example of that. By the time I left, you could already see. You know, the revenue was shifting much more to the vendor side. I mean, that's just yeah. the reality where the the budgets in IT were were headed. So, uh, yeah, it's true. It's I mean, it 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 really is uh, it really is a challenge uh, for organizations. And I think one of the things that I don't have here, but but which I could show you the next time we speak, is information about value for money. And you know, if you think about it, you you would want buyer, you would want customers of analyst firms to say that they were getting great value for money, and and as in most markets, the very largest firms are are, are producing quite quite average value for money, and it's the smallest firms that are delivering high value for money because they're kind of leaving, uh, you know, they're kind of leaving money on the table. You know, they could be charging more. That's why customers say that they're delivering very high very high value for money. But one of the things that I've seen over the last few years is that this perception of, of delivering high value for money and having high independence, this does tend to drive growth. Yeah? And, and I, would have, I would tend to think that these organizations here, so these are amongst the 30 firms with the most users, these are the ones that were highest, uh, highest rated for independence. Many of them are in technology niches or in geographical niches like ecosystems, a firm I really don't know much about, uh, headquartered in Singapore. IT Group, I really do know it's focused on 
financial technology, CCS focused on, on, on telecommunications, serious decision, of course, we're now part of Forrester, uh, but, but it has been focused on marketing. Uh, you know, many of these boutique firms have been able to build a strong reputation for independence. And it's harder for the generalist firms to maintain, uh, to maintain the same independence and the same profitability in the long run. Yeah, but, but most buying organizations that I deal with, I think they, they balance out that risk in that they have yeah. heard a note a decade ago as a thousand points of influence. You know, I mean, yeah. these organizations are complex themselves. They, they, they do peer reviews. They have, you know, different parts of the organization talking to different people. So I think they, mm -hmm. they tend to not rely on just one or two sources and they know they have their ways of balancing out any independence issues. Absolutely. And I think that the, um, I can completely understand why, why importance matters, but very often organizations are, are they're, they're really interested in an authoritative answer, but then they're also interested in, in, in alternatives. They want second opinions. And, and I think this is why some of the organizations that have been most successful, uh, they haven't always been right, but they've always been opinionated. And uh, a, a few years ago, I, I had the, the, the amazing opportunity uh, to spend a summer working through Gideon Gartner's uh, personal archive and uh, looking through um, uh, documents from the 80s and, uh, and 90s through, through the kind of maturing and, and the sale of Gartner and then the establishment of, of Giga Group. And, and you can see one thing that comes across quite clearly there is, um, is, is a confidence in the ability of IT managers to deal with scenarios. And you do, it's not so important that you are right. Yeah, it's so important that you expose the options. And I think there's a degree of intelligence there that I think more organizations could, could respect. It really is. I mean, that, that was one of the earliest uh, boot camp. Um, you know, my remembrance of Gartner was, you know, the probabilities and the, the ability to look at multiple scenarios was, was key. And yeah. You know, in the vendor world, they don't, they don't, they want my scenario. So it's, it's, they don't quite relate to that. Yeah, I think it's a challenge when, when you're dealing with analyst firms that are. The reality is, analyst firms. We're talking about the future. The future is very, very ambiguous, and uh, and there are various ways of dealing with that ambiguity. I mean, we can either admit it or we can pretend that we know everything, and and I actually think it's. Um, uh, it's a sad fact that there are some customers who can deal with that ambiguity and there are other people who so, want to take it away from them. Duncan, not just in IT, Shell, Shell Oil yeah. started after the 1970s, mid-70s, oil, the OPEC oil embargo and all that. They set up a group to do scenario planning for the whole organization. And it wasn't IT specific, it was about you know energy trends and how do we protect against, uh, ourselves against unpredictable scenarios and so on? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think the, if anything the pandemic has taught us, we need to do a lot more scenario planning across, mm -hmm. across the organization. And IT definitely should be affected by that. People are very resistant towards doing this. I, well. You Some know. people are very resistant towards doing oh, this. No, I, Unfortunately, we've become so addicted to our budgeting tools and so on. We've become form formula driven, right? So scenarios yeah. force you to look at things you would never have thought about. Yeah, it's it's a it's a funny example. You know, earlier on we were talking about you know, analyst relations and the way that I completely understand when analyst relations people want to have a have a simpler life. Gartner recently released a strategic planning assumption that forty percent of analyst relations teams would change their role so much uh, that they would stop, that they would have a different name uh, by 2025. This has become a very controversial, uh, almost an existential threat uh, for analyst relations people over the last, uh, over the last year. But the, the prediction of course crystallizes some thinking. Yeah? Uh, some people dig in their heels and say, no, we're not gonna make it happen. 
And then suddenly you see people uh, bro broadening out and thinking about how could analyst relations change and deliver more value to the organization? Should we be looking at third party uh, advisors? Should we be looking at, at, at academics, uh, social market influencers, you know, whatever? So it's interesting to see that that these predictions they can stimulate exactly opposite reactions. You know, they can they can get people thinking, what can I do to change and improve the way in which I'm going to be situated in the future? What can I do to anticipate these changes? And then there are other people who just dig their uh, feet in and say, no, it's not going to happen. You know, and Gardner used to use the terms influence versus intelligence, and the most <laughs> well, no. It, uh, the most enjoyable vendors to me were those where, of course, they were trying to influence, but they would also ask me, what are you hearing? What are you hearing, right? Yeah. Too many vendors are just outbound. They're just pushing. Yeah. They're trying to influence. They don't want to listen. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I mean, the ideal relationship is where there is a back and forth, which means yeah. AR people need to listen, but yeah. try telling them that. <laughs> Also, the the easiest way uh, the easiest way to influence is to listen. Uh, I mean, that's the. I mean, especially with a, uh, especially with with industry analysts. I think every very often you find industry analysts have got like they make particular choices about vocabulary, and they've got particular ideas about the way that they think organizations should conceptualize the the challenge that organizations are dealing with in, in that particular topic, and. If we can learn to speak to analysts in, in their language, then we're just removing one obstacle uh, to uh, to them understanding us. Uh, but so many people in, in, stick in, in their fairness, heels. Yeah. In, in fairness, the analyst world has also become ossified in that the acronyms, some of them should have been retired 20 years ago. And we continue to build magic quadrants and whatever for those industry categories and people who don't buy by those categories anymore, they've moved on, right? Because they buy by verticals and that just happens to be part of their value chain, right? So I think analysts need to evolve also. It's true. There's a lot of, there's been a lot of comedy, I think. There's a, there's a researcher uh, who used to be at the University of Chicago and is now at the University of California at Berkeley called Elizabeth Ponticus. And she and her colleagues did a massive quantitative study of magic quadrants. Yeah? So they were looking at vendors that were, that were in magic quadrants and they were looking to see when the magic quadrant comes around to be refreshed, how have they changed? And so they're there with their, with their rulers and protractors you know, <laughs> looking. And, um, and of course, what they found out was that a very large number of magic quadrants uh, don't get refreshed. Yeah? So m markets get, uh, you know, Gartner kind of recognizes the market. And then within the cycle, it would take to update the magic quadrant, that market is reconfigured. And, and, and um, the, you know, one of the things that has kept me slightly ahead of the curve is I look at a lot of new categories that are emerging, a lot of innovation. And I'm all constantly telling vendors, you know, your total addressable market has grown by five times. If you would just look beyond your category, look beyond your magic quadrant, you know, you missed out, I mean, one of the ERP categories I follow. I keep telling them, guys, Google, Amazon, um, Foxconn, a bunch mm -hmm. of $100 billion companies didn't exist 10, 12 years ago. You could have been in that category yourself, right? Yeah. So, and partly because they, the analyst family actually did not force them to look at new categories yeah absolutely there's something quite um i don't know if you've read um up and to the right uh, richard stinian's book about uh his time as a gartner analyst and, and and what what people should do um he, he relates a story uh of being in charge of a magic quadrant and deciding that a particular piece of functionality should be required by leaders in the magic quadrant in the next round and if you read between the pages, it seems like Richard is in favor of this added functionality, but maybe neither the customers nor the suppliers in the market necessarily want it. And yet within, within a year, all, all, almost all of the vendors have acquired uh, this new functionality and built it into their, into their core platforms. I think this shows a kind of conservatism and a distance 
from the customer and a kind of fearfulness, uh, as well as showing Gartner's uh, as well as showing Gartner's influence, and the the speed with which the uh, the hyperscalers have been able to grow and outmaneuver markets. We talk about third party influencers, you know. Um, you think of these very big, you know, Kindrel, you, know, you think of these huge IT services companies, we could blink and Google could have a bigger IT services business uh, in, a, in six months uh, than, uh, than, 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 than IBM have built in, uh, in, in what, 40 years since Gerstner of trying to build up, uh, you know, managed services businesses. And that's something that um, very few people are thinking about in a strategic way, even though our organizations have all the capacities we need. I think, that is a, I think both of us are saying that there is a flaw within the analyst firms that they are too siloed by categories. And in fact, they should be pushing vendors to look more vertically and more, you know, so multiple categories coming together depending on their vendor client. Absolutely. I think the most successful firms, uh, the ones who are seen as being uh, most independent, the ones who are most valuable, these are often the ones that are starting from a customer problem rather than starting from, from a particular bunch of technologies. Yeah. Vendors start from technologies. They've got solutions looking for problems. Yeah? And uh, because many of these technologies are, they're so, they're so dense, they're so mysterious, it's understandable that you have analysts who are, who are focused in that. But um, I, I do believe that, 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 that Gartner's uh, growth through the purchase of the corporate executive board and the building up of all of this vertical market expertise and, and of course, Forrester's uh, building up of vertical market or professional groups for security managers, for marketing managers and, and so on. I do think that this is uh, not just uh, smart in terms of the way that it focuses people on, on specific customer problems. I think it builds customer loyalty yeah. uh, because um, instead of having to um, articulate for yourself, it's like you have to read through these analyst reports in the hope that you gain revelation. You know, you're reading these mysterious texts in the hope that modestly you may get some wisdom for yourself and, and life is too hard for that. Uh, instead, we, we need analyst firms that are much more focused on, on specific problems and are, are trying to uh, speak not just wisely, but compassionately uh, about the huge pressures that organizations are under and the way that technology can have this immensely liberating impact on organizations. Duncan, this is fantastic. Any any final final thoughts or no, I, I would I would just say that um, industry industry analysts are being used uh, more. That that's what the analyst value survey shows. And and, and I think this reflects this incredible yeah, and, and rate like of change much more, much more sophisticated use too so that that's good to hear. Uh, i believe that's true I, I think you see this in in the way that organize in the way that people who are using analyst firms they're using more analysts uh they have got a stronger sense of which people are valuable and which people are not and I think they're also able like to hold their nose yeah if there's if there's a particular analyst firm and they're the only people producing research on this People are able to consume it and perceive that it has problems. They're able to perceive it may have independence problems, but they're able to they're able to use it without getting contaminated. And I think that's very promising. Fantastic, Duncan. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful speaking with you, Vinny.